So to bring the 1921 census of England and Wales online for the first time was a monumental achievement that I'm privileged to have been a part of. It was the largest digitization project that Find My Past and the National Archives had ever achieved. Over 500 people worked on the project. So you have conservation, image creation, transcription, but then it comes back to, to the Find My Past team again to pull all of these elements together with our product teams and our meticulous engineers. They weave the images and transcriptions together so that you have a seamless online experience. Today, with just a few keystrokes, you can search millions of census records. Enumerating or counting the people is a tradition of England and Wales since the first modern census in 1841. It's an event we've all participated in numerous times. And there's no source like a census. It gives us a snapshot of the entire country on one night. We get to peek into the homes of every individual who's either living or even visiting England and Wales. But what makes digitizing these original forms is that we get to tell that individual story. We know about the census today, and you learn about the facts and the figures and the state of the nation. But by digitizing the original forms, we get to see what your ancestor responded on that day. We get to uncover the real human stories behind those official statistics. So on census night, some had their own agenda. In the post First World War society, the census household schedule became a flashpoint for recording grievances, pleas and frustrations. It was a moment to speak directly to the government or to people who had authority to make decisions. So I want to just tell you about two stories in particular. On the 19th of June, 1921, 60-year-old Charles Lewis completed his household schedule that had been delivered to his home at 14 Frideswale Place in Kentish Town, London. In compliance with the 1920 Census Act, he recorded all of his family members who were in his home, including his wife, Sarah, and his 11-year-old son, Edward. At the time of the census, Charles was out of work and he made that clear on his form. He recorded in an opposite direction to the rest of the text, these words, out of work, out of food, in this glorious empire of ours. He continued to state that his former employers, the Blay, uh, the Blay builders of Dartford, had given him, as he said, given him the sack for being too old and could not get enough profit out of me. Do you know of any job going anywhere? a plea to the census enumerator or the census office to anyone to help. On the same night, Harry Roman, who was a picture framer from Yorkshire, recorded all five members of his family, including and as well as a, a boarder who was staying with them. The family was living in poverty and in cramped conditions with only three rooms in the house for all of these individuals. Harry added to his form a plea for help. He wrote, need help. Yes, I have the great amount of one pound 12 shillings per week to keep seven on. After losing a limb through being called up two and a half years army. We know from Harry's service record that he served with the Yorkshire Regiment 3rd Battalion. He was discharged on the 19th of December, 1918 when he was deemed no longer physically fit for war. During his service, he spent 218 days in France and then a year recovering in England before he was discharged. June 1921 was a time of economic depression, industrial unrest and inequality. The widespread issues affecting England and Wales were demonstrated through waves of strikes, military coups, and the mobilization of thousands in the hunger marches. Now we can see this demonstrated on the individual level by the way the respondents of the 1921 census chose to use that government form that was put through their letterbox to voice their own opinions. Harry and Charles are among hundreds who reappropriated the census schedule to ask for help, protest against the unemployment, and give their opinions about taxes or to scribble discontent on the official state papers. 
But what was it like to take the census 100 years ago? People have said it was the event of the decade, which literally was. We all know census is every 10 years. The census day finally arrived on the 19th of June, 1921. Before that date, 38,000 enumerators walked the streets of England and Wales and hand-delivered the census schedules. Then on the 20th of June, they returned to the homes to collect the forms and to check that the forms were completed and that they were accurate. Find My Past's extensive newspaper collection tells us about that day and gives us a lot more details about the people who were refusing to complete the form or others who were excited to participate in the tradition. Journalists followed the enumerators and they were surprised by some of the overcrowding that they saw in different areas. But not everybody was happy to complete the form and this census schedule tells us that. The enumerator added to the bottom of the form that a very rude woman refused to tell him the number of rooms she had in the house and he had to make a guess. On census day, everyone was counted. And there's one book in this collection that epitomizes this. We were so excited when we were in the studio and we came across this book. And it tells you that regardless of your class or your status, you were counted. This is the census form for Crip Hill Workhouse in Windsor. On the 19th of June, 1921, there were over 200 inmates at the workhouse. Their ages ranged from as young as six months old to 77 years old. Now the workhouse was a grueling place to stay. It was a last resort for many people, for people who couldn't find work or shelter or food. But a few schedules later, in the exact same book bound together, we find the royal household. You can see His Majesty King George V, King Charles III's great-grandfather, and on census night, they have 171 staff members in the building, in the palace. These are servants residing in the palace to serve the royal family. Staying there that night was also King Alfonso III of Spain, and we really enjoyed combing through this census schedule and looking at some of the, the job titles. So within this census schedule, we found the U.O. man of wine cellars, and he also had two assistants for his wine cellars as well. So there's a lot of wine in the palace on the 19th of June, we know that. But what you can see here is two radically different lifestyles and a range of human experiences Regardless if, you're, if your ancestor was a royal or a pauper, you will find them among the 38 million names recorded. The 1921 census is the most comprehensive census to be released to the public. For the first time, the census officials asked you more details about your occupations. They asked you who your employer was, what the address was, so you can now discover not only what your ancestor did for a living, but who they worked alongside every day. And this was a fun part of the digitization process, is looking at the fun job titles, the different unique positions we can see. Some of them are amazing, and we start to get a real sense of connection with people in 1921, because now that they've recorded employer, we start to see those brand names that we know today, and it creates a sense of familiarity. So we have Winifred Hayden here, who's 18 years old, and she's a chocolate sipper at Fortnum & Mason. I'm very jealous of her job. I mean, Tamsin, I like my job, but a, a chocolate <laughs> sipper would be better. <laughs> and she's living at home with her parents in Farnhead Road, just five miles west of here. Then we have Elsie Ottram, the 23-year-old bookkeeper for Singer Sewer, Sewing Machines. And then this, of course, thrilled us at Fi My Pass to find two genealogists visiting from America, Joseph and Elizabeth, and they were actually staying just a half a mile from where the Fi My Pass office is today in London. And they were here in England to visit the Public Record Office, which now we know today is the National Archives. And then we have Henry Loof, who was 32 years old, and he was a Braille writer for the National Library for the Blind, and he actually worked from home where he lived with his parents. Now the parallels between 1921 and today are striking. This is a generation of people who survived a world pandemic. And exactly like us, 
They discussed the need for masks and hygiene to help save lives. And just like us, they navigated a world of repeated strikes and a cost of living crisis. The census itself was delayed because of a strike. The original census date was supposed to be the 24th of April, 1921, and that's the date you see on all of the forms. But as the time got closer to the census date in April, there was an ongoing miners strike occurring. And the rail and the transport workers had voiced that they would join the strike as well, and they would join it in April. 1921. This would have caused widespread disruption to the entire census operation. We have 38,000 enumerators moving around the country on census day. So while this was happening, the Register General took the completely unprecedented decision to postpone the census, and that has never happened since. So the new date was the 19th of June, 1921. Now we're starting to look into a little bit more about why I absolutely love this collection. We get to hear directly from the public, and we have very few opportunities to hear directly from individuals in history. Yes, we have news reports and secondary sources. We have documents that were created by clerks and officials, but it's rare for us to discover a form that was completely created in the hand of our ancestor. This is particularly fascinating when you have a middle class or a working class background. It's not often that you can find documents that your ancestor created. And there's very few uh, primary documents like this. People used the census as an opportunity, as I've explained, to express these concerns and add statements of protest. Here we have Alfred Barners. He's a hackney carriage proprietor. And he wrote on his form that I protest against the expense incurred in taking the census at a time when employment is scarce and prices artificially high. The government would be better advised to give their attention to various trusts controlling the prices of bread, milk, petrol, gravel, soaps, meat, and kindred associations for, following, for robbing the people. Now this statement here, you can imagine actually opening up the newspaper tomorrow and reading this, or scrolling through social media and hearing people protest against high prices. In another example, we have Albert Westerman of Yorkshire, who was not happy that he was still married. <laughs> and as he put it, because of the rotten system of divorce. Divorce law at the time was on the verge of being reformed, so it's a, it was a topic being repeatedly discussed in the newspapers and in Parliament. And we've seen a few individuals uh, who added uh, their comments about divorce and about this topic in particular, either for or against. Clearly, Albert's for divorce. And as I mentioned before, the census was postponed, the first and only to be postponed. And one of the biggest controversies of the 1921 census was that the census form was actually wrapped in an advertisement to offset the cost of changing the census date and having to print official notices to explain this to everybody. The government allowed an advertisement to be printed on the enclosure that accompanied the form. And this enclosure was, had the advertisement for the Sunday Illustrated which was a new Sunday newspaper that was going to start being published in July 1921, and you can now read on Find My Past. So imagine if you received a government document in the post, you, your passport application, and it's wrapped in an advertisement by the Daily Mail or the Guardian. So people were surprised and a little bit annoyed, I would say, by this. And we found hundreds of comments about this advertisement and in particular, the questionable character of Horatio Bottomley, who owned the newspaper. Bottomley had been an MP and had been taken to court for defrauding on war bonds. So he did not have a very good reputation as well. So this is where we saw the largest amount of critiques and attacks on the government within the census forms. The public call it the gutter press and they emphatically protested against the enclosure on the official census form. 
Now, the biggest twist to this entire story is that Horatio Bottomley never even paid for the advertisement. He had a marketing firm create the advertisement on his behalf, but he never actually paid them. And they took him to court and he still didn't pay them. So another act of fraud or swindling on top of this. Now these records reveal the personal stories of millions of souls who survived the First World War, a cataclysmic event that cut across the lives of everyone living in England and Wales. The census carries the weight of a country rediscovering itself and questioning what it means to be a world power. It is heartbreaking to read some of these forms that reveal the personal effects of war. One individual wrote that they were formerly self-employed, but, but now permanently disabled through injury to the right shoulder and the top of the spine. This very serious condition of health precludes the possibility of following any occupation in the future. We also have the census form for Harold, Harold Orpin, who typed his form and added a note of apology for doing that because it was against the instructions. He wrote, I regret not being able to fill up this schedule in ink as directed, but I lost half my right hand in the war um, and cannot write. By using Find My Pass, large collection of military and First World War records, we have been able to piece together Harold's story, and we found out that he served in the Anglo-Boer War. He was later a captain with the reserve of officials attached to the Royal Berkshire Regiment. And then in the First World War, he worked for the intelligence department. And we have those pieces of information from his military records. But now with the census form, we have direct testimony from Harold to understand how that war service affected his life. 38 million people are in the 1920 census, 1921 census. But all you need is one record. That census form completed by your ancestor in their handwriting that from today now can become part of your story. So like many of my colleagues, my partner over the last years has had to endure me going on about our historical collections and how excited about this newspaper title or this new parish register release. But the 1921 census was a little different. Of course, within a few hours of it being published, I had to search for known names in the record set and I used my partner's family tree. Now, I assume by this point of the talk, you've all figured out I'm not British. I'm from Philadelphia, so unfortunately I don't have any direct ancestors in the 1921 census, but I'm going to keep trying. I've looked at every lateral line I can, and I will find somebody. But at the launch, I searched for my wife's great-grandmother, Ruth May, or Golgi, as she was known by the family. Within seconds, I found the family together living on a dairy farm in Surrey. And when I brought this information to my wife, she was surprised. Her family isn't big storytellers. They don't pass down the family history to one another. But it only took a few moments before some childhood memories started to flood back. She had been on that farm. She suddenly remembered visiting her father's family in England and being on a farm and she could immediately have sense memory. She could smell the farm and see the kitchen. And more importantly than anything else, she remembers Golgi and seeing her. And would you believe, after learning all of that, she's lactose intolerant. <laughs> but it's these magical moments that bring you a family connection that inspires myself and I know all of my colleagues that find my past to continue our work to digitize millions of records and newspapers every year. We found some really beautiful family discoveries and family moments on the pages of the census form. Like newborn baby Galway was born only a few days before the census was taken. And it was so early that they didn't even have a name for him. So he is simply baby Galway. Or the families that couldn't help themselves to add their pets. Now, days before the census, the Daily Mirror did release this cartoon from Pip and Squeak to inform everybody that unfortunately pets are not to be counted in the census. 
But that did not stop many families. We found numerous pets, cats, dogs, ferrets, horses, even parrots. So here we have Ginger and Dinky of Stratford, as well as a dog named Spot, who's recorded as seven years old and he's married. <laughs> His occupation is house dog. So you can see by the line that the enumerator had added, he wasn't excited about this joke. So I invite you to take a look at 1921 census. What marks or features are in your house that you want to know who put that there and why? How many generations lived in your home? Could you look up the house of your grandmother or your great-grandmother? And reading that form, seeing how many rooms are in the house, you can remember the, the touch of the banister, the smell of the entrance. Could your home have been used by a doctor? And they could have been seeing patients in the same room that you put up your feet in the evening and watch Gogglebox. Or could your home have been a boarding house, like nine York buildings, a bustling boarding house with 15 people, including Florence Allen, who was an actress with the Gaiety Theater in the West End. Each boarder recorded their name in their own style, which was really unusual. Normally, it's the head of the household that records everybody's names for them. But we know from this form, on census night, the head of the household was actually out for the night. And it was actually the, um, the boarding house servant who took the lead to make sure that everybody was recorded. And she's the one that signed the form at the end of the day. Among the numerous names, we have Catherine Berger, Bergen, sorry, from Belfast, who was working in this very hotel as a cashier 100 years ago. So I hope that I've been able to show you the breath of discoveries waiting for you in the 1921 census. Thank you.